أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما نافعا اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه ربي اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to the Reflections on the Risale-i Nur by Bedrizaman Said Nursi podcast series This is Mustafa Tuna You can listen to the episodes of this series or watch them at the website www.reflections-rn.org or you can access it through your favorite podcast provider or through YouTube at the channel name Reflections RN. Uh, please subscribe there. That helps me understand the level of interest out there, inshallah. Um, this will be the sixth of our introductory episodes in the video format. Uh, we had done these introductions earlier when we first started the podcast a long time ago. Um, however, I want these to be available in uh, video format too, so I'm doing it. Uh, we did four episodes on the life of Bedu Zaman Said Nursi. We did one episode on what the Risale Nur is, trying to describe, define, have a better understanding of what the Risale Nur is. In this episode, inshallah, we will talk about why one should read the Risale Nur. What's the purpose in reading the Risale Nur? And then if we have time, we will also uh, share some reflections on how to read the Risale Inur. Okay, let's go ahead. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. <clears throat> Why read the Risale Inur? Um, by the way, in this episode, I'm not going to share text on the screen. Uh, most of this is what I have written, and uh, it is written in s- somewhat more detail than the uh, previous. Uh, text so I'm going to be reading most of what I have uh, written and there will be less commentary so I chose to not put the text on the uh, screen I thought this would be better uh, in terms of uh, retaining attention okay bismillah why read the Risale Inur the messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said actions are according to intentions so whatever we do in life, we first need to look into our intentions. Uh, the question why calls for the question of intention. And intention is not what we want to do. So if I take a pen and write with the pen, my intention is not writing with the pen. My intention is, say I'm writing a letter, my intention is to put my thoughts on paper and send that letter to say a friend and share those thoughts with that friend my intention is to share my thoughts with my friend so intention is what we want to acquire in doing something so if we are reading Risale in order the question is what do we want to acquire what benefit do we want to get from reading the Risale in order And the benefit that one gets from reading the Risale Inur will depend on one's intention in reading the Risale Inur. So this is an important, important question. The Risale Inur is an innovative work of Kalam, dialectical theology, for instance. It expands the boundaries of this science, the science of Kalam, and resolves many questions that have been left unresolved in the tradition. Right? So um, it is also an invaluable and original work of uh, tafsir, Quranic exegesis, uh, and it also helps us a lot with understanding the prophetic traditions and gives us beautiful commentaries on the prophetic traditions. So, students and scholars of these sciences, the science of Kalam, the science of tafsir, uh, Quranic exegesis, the science of hadith, prophetic traditions, can read the Risale in order to uh, learn something about their respective disciplines. So this could be one intention in reading the Risale Inur. It's a possible intention. It's, it's fine, right? Well, let's think of another example. The Risale Inur is um, you know, one of the best commentaries ever written in the history of Islam. And you know, once again, I'm saying this without any qualms. 
this Ali Nur is one of the best commentaries written in the history of Islam about the Quran. An academic researcher who studies in the field of Islamic studies, and this person doesn't even have to be a Muslim, right? An academic researcher can look at the Risale or, you know, examine, analyze it to understand uh, this, what it contributes to the field of uh, tafsir, Quranic commentaries. So that's another possible intention in reading the Risale Nur. <clears throat> Here's an interesting one. The Risale Nur is a, is a um, literary masterpiece. It preserves the classical Turkish language uh, of the Ottoman era. And the Turkish language has changed tremendously in the past century, uh, since the 1920s, especially since the 1940s and on. Uh, so a linguist can look at the Risale in order to understand the transformation that has taken place in the Turkish language since the early 20th century. This is another possible intention, right? So there are lots of possible intentions out there. What is our intention? That is the big question. So I would say, I would say the real intention, that is the real benefit that one should seek in reading the Risale in Ur, um, relates to an incomparably more urgent matter. It is incomparably more essential, more important, vital than all these possible intentions that we listed as examples. And it is to attain certainty in faith, preserve it and increase in it. So I would say in reading the Risale Nur, one's intention should be to attain certainty in faith, to preserve it and to increase it. And therefore by doing so, come closer to God, come closer to God, right? To purify one's heart, to purify one's intellect, to understand the matters of faith um, and internalize them. Right? This is the intention that we want to have in reading the Risale Nur, or this is why we should read the Risale Nur. So we should read the Risale Nur to attain certainty in faith, to preserve it and to increase in it. Now, why is that the case? Why should we do this? Right? And this is an this is a question that we should and can ask to in, in relation to each and every book of religion that we read. Whether one were reading Imam Rabbani or Imam Ghazali or Abdul Qadir Jailani or uh, Imam Haddad or you know some somebody more uh, who has lived in a more recent time, right? Regardless, why do we read a book about our religion? Okay, or why do we read a book at all? Why should we seek certainty in faith in reading the Risale Nur or any other book about religion? Right? Well, this is why. Death is certain to come and final judgment is not to be, to be avoided. In this world, each and every human being needs certainty in faith in order to escape the bitterness or bitter expectation of um, absolute annihilation at the end of one's lifetime. Death is a reality and it is in front of all of us. Whether we use various psychological tricks and so on and so forth to not think about it or not, it is going to come. And the knowledge of, the certainty of death, the expectation of death, embitters all pleasures for all of us. Imagine this. They invited you to a feast, a, a, a feast that you have never seen the like of before. Beautiful, comfortable, entertainment and you know food is delicious so you are invited to this and it's and and you also think that it is an honor to be invited to this place so you you, you go you enter but as you enter they tell you here is the feast enjoy it you can stay here for a whole day do as you wish but there is one condition 
as you leave the the, the hall where this this feast and entertainment is taking place we are going to execute you we are going to you know uh, give you some poison and you will you know fall here and disappear you will not exist any longer there isn't even life after death right because death is certainty and what comes after death for someone who does not have certainty in faith is annihilation complete annihilation that embitters the pleasures of life so to be able to enjoy life to be able to enjoy uh, yourself in this life to be able to enjoy the various pleasures and beauties that you are blessed with in this life you need to have certainty in faith you need to have certainty that what's awaiting you at the end is not complete annihilation there is life after death so that's the benefit in this world what about the hereafter well each and every human being needs certainty in faith to escape eternal suffering in hellfire and to earn, to and to win eternal bliss in paradise faith certainty in faith is the key to, to paradise you cannot enter paradise without it so you need it in order to enter paradise you need it for it your, your eternal salvation right therefore you want certainty in faith God does not want to torment his slaves he wants them to know him to turn to him and to meet him in paradise look at the video of that right we are here but we are not here to be tormented we are here to know God to worship him to yearn for him and ultimately to meet him in paradise um, to achieve this he sends us he sends us his words his message in the form of the Quran and other holy books and scriptures scrolls he makes signs that point to him in the creation he makes them manifest he also sends messengers to explain all those signs that he has placed both in his holy books and scrolls and in his creation right so he sends us messengers to guide us he does not leave us alone he guides us muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the seal of messengers he is the last messenger the message that god wanted to to, to reveal uh, to humanity is complete with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the last prophet whose light carries through so he died but his light carries through how does it carry through but, but it first it carried through it carried through all prophets before him but after him it carries through his inheritors who are his inheritors his inheritors are scholars gnostics saints right he left scholars behind as the inheritors of his message and now his light carries through his inheritors his message and his character was the quran so what is the message that carries through with the prophet's inheritors it is the quran the quran is god's eternal word that is not bound by time or place this is important the quran was not sent to uh, muhammad ibn uh, abdullah al-arabi in the you know seventh century uh, Qurayshi, and the people around him alone it was sent to him but it was not sent to him alone it is sent to the entire creation especially humanity and therefore it's not bound by time and place it is an eternal word from the pre-eternal and post-eternal creator it is his eternal knowledge right it it is an eternal address to all those who have understanding at all times and at all places all together and one by one each time and each place and each individual in each time and place have their share from the Quran's eternal address so its message is universal but we each have our particular shares from that 
as a generation but one by one individually too so we then need to open our understanding to it and find our ways to god through it its message is there but we need to open our understanding to understand it to receive it the inheritors of the messenger of god sallallahu alaihi wasallam unfold the intricacies and hidden gems of that address for the believers and for humanity in accordance with the preparedness of their respective times and circumstances so the message is universal the message is there and there's a share for each and every community each and every human being from uh, you know from, uh, from that message but how do they get it well inheritors of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam scholars who study his message who spend their time with sincerity and in the end god blesses them god blesses them and blesses the community of believers through them with the light of the quran by the keys to the quran by unfolding the message of the quran that is particularly relevant and related and illuminating for the time that we live in and bedu zaman and bedu zaman said nursi is one of the foremost among the inheritors of the prophetic message at our time so why read the quran uh, sorry, why read the risale nur because it is a key to the quran and it is a key to the quran among many keys to the quran that is most relevant to our times that is a blessing from god to our times and the children of children of adam living at our times it's a favor it's a grace it's a blessing from god to us for us to be able to understand the divine message so that we get to know our lord so that we worship him with a better understanding and knowledge of him and in the end inshallah we move in the direction of moving him our lord in paradise in the risale inur ustad nursi takes his readers gently by the hand and guides them through the messages of the quran as the revealed book and the world out there as the created book now this is an important aspect of uh, the risale inur it combines three things or perhaps even more than that but at least three things one it is a key gateway to the quran it is a commentary on the quran it is a book it is an inspiration from the quran and it helps us understand the quran better second it is a key it's a gateway to reading the signs in the creation and it's important we read the quran and the signs in the creation together and they corroborate one another and from that corroboration that emerges emerges yaqeen in our hearts uh, certainty in our hearts right the third aspect it does all of this in an easy gentle way that's intelligible to uninitiated minds it does not suffocate you in uh, the terminology of particular scholarly disciplines for instance i mean it might be very difficult to read a kalam book uh, although the risale inur is a kalam book however it is not difficult to read it takes you gently by the hand and educates you right subtly gradually with lutf right with subtlety and gentleness um and as such it shows the readers the believers the signs in the quran and in the creation explains their meanings and patiently helps the readers grasp those meanings so it is a book that addresses even the um, even the least initiated most uninitiated believer even children can read it and understand it this does not mean that the level of understanding that a 10 year old child has from the risale nur and the level of understanding that say a uh, you know accomplished scholar who has gone through the entire tradition and memorized books and studied and has a has, has an understanding high level of understanding of many of the matters of the religion and so on and so forth receives from the risale of course there's a difference between the two of course there's a difference 
but there is benefit for everybody and that the Rusayi Nur is able to address that high level scholar and provide some benefit to that scholar does not cause it to be um, difficult or repelling uh, for the 10 year old. It's accessible and there's benefit in it for everybody. It's accessible at multiple levels. The signs in the Quran and the world out there both point to God. So the signs in the Quran and the signs in the creation both point to God. The more one understands that, the more one knows God. The more one knows God, the better one worships God. And that is the ultimate purpose of our existence in this world. Right? That is the knowing God and worshiping God is the ultimate purpose of our existence in this world. As God says in the Quran, And I did not create a jinn and a mankind except to worship me. This is Quran chapter 51 verse 56. Therefore, therefore, in intending to attain, preserve and increase in faith by reading the Risale Inur, right? what is the intention of that intention? We intend, we read the Risale Inur with the intention to attain, preserve and increase in faith. But what is the intention of that intention? What do we want to acquire by doing that? Right? In doing that, one intends to fulfill the essential function of being a human being. One intends to uh, fulfill the covenant with with God, right? God created those spirits, gathered them in the plains of Arafah, and asked them, "Alas, to be Rabbikum, am I not your your Lord?" They all said, "Bala, you are yes, you are our Lord." And in that uh, acknowledgement of His Lordship, we entered into a covenant with 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 God that. We are going to worship him. We are going to know him. We are going to be his obedient slaves throughout our lives. And when I say throughout our lives, that means from that moment we said, Kalu, moment, we, moment we said, Bella, yes, you are our, our Lord, all the way to eternity. Right? This life is but an episode in that larger, broader story of the human existence. So we need to and want to be faithful slaves to our Lord and that requires knowing Him and knowing Him is possible by reading the signs in His revealed book or books uh, to the extent that they are not uh, corrupted in His revealed book and the created book. And we are equipped by with the instruments tools, uh, senses, gadgets to, to read these signs, to understand these signs, right? So if that's our purpose and we, are, we have the means to, then we need to have the will to fulfill the covenant. And reading the Risale Nur is something that's going to help us do that. It's going to teach us. It's going to hold our hands gently and teach us the signs in the revealed book and the signs in the creation and how they corroborate one another, right? It's going to help us purify our hearts and purify our minds. Now, faith is not a commodity that one can obtain once and keep unchanged forever. And this is a matter of uh, discussion in the, uh, the tradition, but ultimately what we mean here is that you either have faith or you don't have faith, right? It's like you either have money in your pocket or you don't have money in your pocket. That's a clear cut uh, difference. And whoever has an Adam's weight of, you know, faith will ultimately enter paradise. And whoever does not have faith will at all will not enter paradise. So you either have faith or you don't have faith. But if you have money in your pocket, that may be one dollar two dollars hundred dollars one thousand dollars twenty thousand dollars right it can be anything right so faith is something that you either have or not but once you have it well you can first of all you can lose it right second of all it can increase and decrease and its increase and decrease manifests itself in your 
uh, ability to yearning for worshiping your Lord, worshiping God in your actions, in your, in our deeds, in our states and actions rather. It it, it manifests itself in our states and actions. Uh, it can lose purity, right? Our faith can lose purity. Doubts can come, challenges, questions, and we are living at an age when, where this is horribly possible challenges to faith right it is a horrible horrible age to live in if you want to preserve your faith it's it's it manifests the meaning of the prophetic tradition in which the prophet وسلم, said there will come a time and faith will be like a an amber that you will you know if you hold in your hand it's going to burn your hand if you don't hold if you throw it you'll burn in in hell right it's a difficult time to be. There are so many challenges and faith can lose its purity as a result of this. Satan chases believers throughout their lives to steal their faith. Throughout their lives, up to the very last moment <clears throat> in which the spirit leaves the body. Up to that very last moment, Satan chases believers to steal their faith. They say that at that last moment, one becomes very thirsty and Satan comes with a cup of water and offers water in return for uh, your faith. So there's a danger out there. There's a threat out there. Believers need to be armed and protected to keep their faith. We want to be armed and protected to keep our faith. And moreover, we need to nurture our faith to increase in it and travel nearer to God. So we, should, we, we, we also don't want to be satisfied by just having faith, like by just having one dollar in our pocket, maybe. Right? We want to increase our faith. We want to increase, or maybe we want to increase in faith and move closer to our Lord. The stronger our faith is, the closer we um, we, we come to our Lord and that faith manifests itself in our actions in our worship the the stronger our faith is the more we worship and we the more we worship with ikhlas uh, sincerity and purpose which is a coefficient to our actions the purer our intention is in uh, worshiping which is a coefficient to our actions right so we want to build up our faith we live closer to the end of times. Right? It's difficult to say we live at the end of times. Maybe we do. It's, it's quite likely, but we live closer to the end of times. That's certain. And as time goes by, preserving and nurturing faith becomes more difficult for the believers, as we just talked about. Ustad Nursi says that removing misguidance that originates from ignorance is easier than removing misguidance that originates from knowledge. Right? If people had misguide, if a person has misguidance, that is the result of uh, ignorance. You can just provide the information that this person was missing, and you know, he now knows, and uh, he, he he may now have uh, he may now be guided to the right path, right? You may easily remove the misguidance of this person if it is only a matter of knowledge, right, uh, or ignorance. But if the misguidance is coming from knowledge i.e if it is compounded ignorance right that the person does not know but does not know that does not know either and he knows things that are false but he thinks that they are accurate that they are true right that's more difficult to remove because you you first need to prove to this person that what he thinks he knows is false and that's difficult to do right um misguided knowledge therefore only increases one's ignorance and most of misguidance at our time is out of misguided knowledge and this is a big problem right one in a thousand individuals in the earlier days say at a time when a believer was born in a village where everybody else were believers and they all said the same thing they all believed in the same thing they their faith was not challenged by outside sources nobody came up came out and said like well maybe that's not true maybe 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 that right 
when the, their faith was not challenged. Right? This was the state in which believers existed most of the time. So one in a thousand fell into misguidance out of knowledge in the earlier times. That's out of misguided knowledge in the earlier times. And one in a thousand of those, like because this person would fall into misguided, uh, you know, misguidance out of misguided knowledge in a context where it's so difficult to do, one in a thousand of those who fell into misguidance out of misguided knowledge could be saved by argumentation and information and knowledge and so on and so forth through persuasion. Yet, since the enlightenment and the scientific revolution uh, and the expansion of the ideas that emerge from these, the positivist, materialist, scientist ideas that emerge from these historical processes in Europe, since their expansion to, the, to, to all of the world through public education, through uh, media and so on and so forth, and also on top of that, in our times, uh, as a result of the propaganda and advertisement of, uh, of, of capitalism, the consumerist society, all of these, as a result of all of these, right? The most formidable challenge to faith today, to faith and religion, right? Originates from science and educated elites. So that's an unprecedented thing in our lives most formidable challenge to our faith emerges from uh, science and educated elites. Global improvements in communications have brought that challenge to each and every home, right? It's, it's, you know, on your cell phone, on your computer, on your TV screen, maybe on the radio, right? Global changes in transportation and communication have brought misguided knowledge to each and every home, each and every car, each and every um, earbud, right? You can put those earbuds in your ear and listen to misguided knowledge, mis volada, right? Deviation. All you want, all you want. Modern schooling makes it a staple of our upbringing we send our kids to school and what are what are they exposed to there unless we provide an alternative paradigm unless we uh give them the tools unless we arm their faith and protect it unless we give them the tools to arm and protect their faith the kind of stuff that one might be exposed to in public education or public the, the public more broadly, right, the media and so on and so forth, it's um, scary, right? The ease and comfort that modern technology offers has led human beings to a state of constantly deepening attachment to the material world and its distractions, especially in the form of entertainment. So this is the other aspect of it. It's not only knowledge, but it's also addressing the lower soul and, and distracting. Nation states then have taken down the institutional structures and boundaries. So this used not to happen in the past. First of all, the technology was not there. But also, if, say, the technology was not there, but a misguided person came to a village and tried to uh, deviate the children of that village and so on and so forth, right? the society would push back. The society would prevent this. The society would chase that person out silence that person right but that that cannot happen now because nation states and industrialization took down the boundaries took down the institutions that preserved religion and religiosity in societies mere imitation that is being socialized into a believing community and uh appropriating internalizing its values as a and as a consequences of the process of socialization right is really sufficient now because first of all those societies don't exist second there are so many alternatives so many alternative communities that one lives throughout one's life sometimes simultaneously 
The work is a community. The mosque is another community. The marketplace is another community. The uh, social media is another community. So it is fragmented. The entire life is fragmented. And most of those fragmented constellations of uh, human beings and information flowing through those networks or constellations, right? Most of it is misguided. And we cannot avoid it. We cannot avoid it. Thus, preserving faith requires a level of persuasion that is on the understandable and convincing for every individual who faces the tribulations of the times that we live in right so we need we need a uh, resource we need that we need a resource that's going to provide sufficient persuasion both to our intellect to our heart and also our lower souls like all of them and going to empower them empower us against the challenges of this scary world that's out there this is so I'm, i talked about persuasion but you know don't take me wrong this is not about logical argumentation alone like it has to have logical foundations because if it is not logical it's not going to make sense and you know you won't go after what does not make sense unless you know you are you are that kind of person who goes after what does not make sense right but most people assuming that people have intellect and sound judgment right or those who have intellect and sound judgment won't go after information after logical argumentation that does not make sense so it it, it has to make sense right it has to have the logical foundations but it is not about logical argumentation alone it is very rare for disbelief to originate from conviction in the absence of god so say it's not possible but say there there is some logical argumentation i mean it is possible in if it is false right but let's say that there is some logical argumentation out there for the non-existence of hasha god uh, it, it, it will have fallacies, but the fallacies are so hidden that you miss it, right? This is, it is very rare for a person to become an atheist, not believe in God, a disbeliever out of such a conviction in such an argument, right? Most disbelief is not about a conviction about the absence of God, but rather, what is it, right? Um, what characterizes the state of most disbelievers is the absence of a conviction about the existence of god and these are two different things conviction about the absence of god and absence of conviction about the existence of god you know the first one is an affirmative uh statement and confirmation the second is suspense the person may not have conviction about the uh, existence of God, right? But he can then keep himself in suspense. And his lower soul can dupe him. His lower soul can dupe him into uh, you know, living a fragmented life. Even when he wants to enjoy the life without regard to what is permissible, what is forbidden, what is good, what is evil, he will assume that there is no God, that there is no higher being. When the bitterness of death, the annihilation at the end of life dawns on him, he will say, well, maybe there is God. Maybe there is God. Maybe there is eternity and so on. So maybe there, maybe, you know, the faith is accurate, right? So these are two different, different uh, things. Now, the second, as we described in this example, the second the uh, absence of a conviction about the existence of God, right, is often caused by the afflictions of the compulsive soul, not the, I mean, not the intellect, because it is just, you know, suspending intellect. Your intellect is not working at that moment, right? It is most of the time about the afflictions of the compulsive soul, that's the nafs, right, such as pride. The person is has too much pride in 
his uh, or her community, disbeliever community, and doesn't want to leave its customs and faith and belief and so on and so forth. This is one possibility, right? Um, or habit, right? One was one socializes into a disbelieving community and just can't leave it. Can't his 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 thoughts, ideas, convictions become habit, and he just cannot leave them, right? But this is a sickness of the compulsive soul because this person is not seeking truth, right? Uh, mere unwillingness to submit to a higher authority, as we talked in the example, right? The, he he wants to, uh, you know, live his life without attention in regard to what is halal, what is haram, what is forbidden, what is uh, permissible, right? And so on and so forth, like fear. And, and these are the things that that prevent most people from being able to have faith, right? So therefore, uh, empowering people against disbelief cannot be only about logical argumentation right for persuasion to work it needs to be addressed not to the intellect alone but to all human faculties such as the compulsive soul and the heart along with the intellect it needs to break the compulsive soul's resistance and polish the heart so that it becomes a clearer mirror to, to, to reality right so a true righteous guidance needs to address both the heart, the intellect, well, all of the heart, the intellect, the compulsive soul, and whatever other faculties that the human being has. It has to be comprehensive. It has to be holistic. The convincing proofs of the Risale Inur. So what about the Risale Inur? Right? The convincing proofs of the Risale Inur open a gateway through the intellect and the imagination to the heart and the compulsive soul and persuades them as well. So this is a secret of the Risale Inur. It provides logical argumentation, it is convincing, but at the same time it opens a gateway to the heart, to the compulsive soul, in addition to the intellect, uh, also imagination, and it persuades them all, right? It, it, if you will, will, it absorbs you into its aura as with your whole entity. And this is the experience of those who read the Risale Inur uh, with attention and understanding. And they, they, they cannot even stop reading it because that, that aura is also pleasurable. It is the, I mean, what you taste there is the pleasure of the taste, the delight of faith. You taste the delight of faith in the when you are absorbed into into that aura with your whole existence. In an age when science and education subconsciously subconsciously ingrain positivism in our understanding in our thinking, that is, renders us unable to believe in what we do not see, and that is a um, fundamental sickness of our times, some fundamental sickness of the human heart at our times. As a result of all that, you know, process, enlightenment, scientific revolution, materialism, positivism, public education, media, consumerism, and so on, communication, transportation, so on and so forth. As a result of all of those, somewhere deep inside, we are all positivist to some level. This was not the case for the, uh, or if, if it still exists, for the Bedouin living in the desert, without being exposed to all of this nonsense that has... Uh, characterized our lives and that we think is progress but that is digging its own grave we dug our own graves and we are proud of it right but at any way anyway in an age like this the Risale Nur builds on the Quranic command to behold the signs of divine unity in the creation and helps us see God manifesting wherever we turn so this is a very important uh, contribution of the Risale Inur to our tradition. Now, it is not an innovation. It is there. It is in the Quran. The, the command of behold, right? Do you not see? Do you not think? Look at, right? The signs of God. Th this is a Quranic command. This is a Quranic injunction, right? But actualizing it. And doing it in a way that's going to uh, help us navigate the troubles, the 
troubled waters of this age? That's a different question. The Risale Nur helps us see the signs of creation wherever we turn and therefore it is a cure to our sickness of positivism in which we have difficulty believing in what we do not see. It, uh, it, the, the reflection and contemplation that the Risale Nur offers helps us to look at the tree and see a razaq see al jamil see al mateen see al hay see al qayyum see al quddus look at the entire creation and see the the divine names uh attributes and conducts manifest this is something that we want to attain right i mean we want to attain it regardless of this the the sicknesses of the age that we live in but in this day and age it becomes especially important especially important because we are sick we are sick so it helps us see god manifest in wherever we turn then it shows the heart and the compulsive soul the ugliness of living in a state of disbelief it shows you the bitterness the burning taste of the pleasures that you think you are enjoying in this world while death is awaiting you ultimately in the end right it shows the heart and the compulsive soul the ugliness of living in a state of disbelief and the beauty that is discerned in the creation through the light of faith here and now it helps us discern the beauty in the creation here and now as we live in this world right beholding god is something that we do in this world and we do that by beholding his names attributes conducts manifest in the creation the risale nur both convinces and educates the intellect and addresses the heart and the compulsive soul through the intellect and imagination so it addresses and educates the intellect right but through the intellect and imagination it addresses the heart and the compulsive soul as such it does not only explicate the verses of the quran so this is what we usually expect from a quranic uh, exegesis take the verse word by word give me the meaning of the word uh, tell me how it relates to the other words in the sentence uh, tell me the meaning that comes out of this perhaps put into context of revelation and so on and so forth this is all necessary this is all beautiful uh said nusi was an expert on this and because of his preparation the background and this he was able to receive the inspirations from the quran in the way that he did so it's important and necessary right but that's not sufficient we need to be able to move beyond that clerical learning right to actualizing that learning in the life in the world that we live right so to do that the Risale Nur also mirrors the Quran's pedagogy in guiding God's slaves back to God it does not tell its readers to leave the world right so leave the world inculcate an understanding of the flimsiness of its existence and from that move to an understanding of its relative non-existence or inculcate uh, an understanding of its worthlessness and through that understanding try to forget its existence forget its existence right so these are all methods these are all lines of thinking and acting that help us um, move from the transient temporal world to the higher reality or realities and ultimately to the knowledge of God. But it's difficult. It's difficult uh, and it's, it has become almost impossible for for the great majority of people it's impossible to do so in this world because it requires so much inculcation so much discipline so much isolation and insulation and we cannot do that 
at this time, right? So, um, instead of that, the Risale you know, tells people to look at the world with a fresh Quranic perspective and witness divine will and power all around. So this is this is another way, and this is also in the tradition, but it has been, uh, you know, put on the back burner for a long time, uh, when it was apt to do that, right? But in, in, in this day and age, when we are all positivists to some extent, it is very difficult to 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 not look, and not see, and not be influenced by what see. What we need now, therefore, is to see it with a fresh perspective, right? And to as a and, and as a result of that fresh perspective, to witness divine will and power all around, to witness the manifestations of God's beautiful names, his attributes, his conducts all around, to look at the tree and see a work of God, a work of creation, an artifact, a sign of the divine. That's what we want. Like the Quran. That is, this is the method of the Qur'an, right? Like the Qur'an, the Risale Nur takes its readers through a journey from human self to the horizons of the cosmos, from an observation of subatomic particles to an investigation of galaxies, from trees to stars, and on. Right? It, this is what the Qur'an does. The Qur'an talks us about the trees, the stars, the, the spider, they, uh, they, you know, the particle, the uh, human, uh, you know, the embryo, and from the embryo, the growth of the embryo, the moon, the stars, the, the, the earth, how the spring comes and everything comes back to life. All of these things are in the Quran. The mosquito, right? Start, start from the mosquito, go all the way to all, all the galaxies. This is in the Quran. And there is Sali Nur reflects that method of the Qur'an, right? And takes us on a journey through the creation to see the signs of creation. In the process, it helps its readers acquire a sense of presence before God. Right? This is the important, this is what we are trying to attain here. In the process, it helps its readers attain a sense of presence before God because if you see the signs of creation, if you see the signs of the divine, wherever you turn, then wherever you turn, you will be reminded about the presence of the creator and therefore you will be living with a sense of being in his presence. It exposes, by doing so, it exposes its readers to God's unity, divinity, mercy which are all manifest in each and every creation and in the entire creation all together so that's also another thing that we need to work on it may be easy to see all of this in the entire creation all together it's so big so magnificent and you say well nobody other than the all-powerful can create this beautiful but you cannot behold the entire creation in your intellect or imagination at all times you're lucky if you have done it once in your life or you do it once in your life most of the time we we are face to face with particulars so we want to be able to see that in the particulars too wherever we turn we want to see it wherever we turn so we read the Risale Nur because it puts us uh, on this journey, right? It it helps us to take this Quranic and prophetic journey. It's a Quranic and prophetic journey, and the Risale Nur helps us take that journey. And importantly, it it helps us do so in a Quranic and prophetic way, right? Because there may be other traditions out there. There are other traditions out there who want you to look at the world and you know read signs, etc., etc. And they, you know, at least understood that there are signs out there. That's an important step from the positivist scientist uh, position that dominates the world today. That denies that there are signs. There are. There's meaning to all of this. 
right? So there are other traditions that say that there's meaning to all of this, but the problem is those meanings, understanding those meanings require, uh, you know, or, or let's put it this way, reading the meanings in this book of the creation requires knowing its alphabet. If you don't know the alphabet, you are going to, you know, make out this here, that there, but you won't be able to get the whole picture. You won't be able to read the whole thing in an accurate manner. And there will be lots of falsehood mixed, is mixed into your truth. But if the message is coming from the knower of all, the one who created this all, then there's no room for falsehood in it. It has a knowledge of the complete alphabet, the complete grammar, complete vocabulary, right? It knows how to read what's out there. And what knows how to read out there, or what teaches us how to read what's out there? What is the uh, language instructor of the language of the universe, language of the signs of creation in the creation? It's the Quran and the Prophet wasallam. So, the Risale Nur follows, right, the method of instruction that was provided to humanity in the Risale Nur. Uh, I'm sorry, that was provided to humanity in the Quran and the prophetic traditions, in the Quran and the Sunnah, right? So it keeps us within the broad highway of the Ahl al Sunnah, the community of the Sunnah, people of the Sunnah, people of the followers of the Prophet. It keeps us in the consensus that emerges from the centuries-long investigation of scholars. It keeps us in the tradition. It keeps us in the safe zone, right? The Prophet wasallam said that his ummah would uh, branch into, uh, you know, multiple seventy-three lots of different branches, and only one of them will be. Uh, will be successful with regard to eternal salvation. And that is those who follow his path, the Ahlul Sunnah. So the Risale Inur does not put us on the path of some ill-informed innovation, does not put us on the path of some ill-informed deviation from the path of the Prophet, from the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. It keeps us within the Sunnah. This is a light that radiates from the Quran and the Sunnah. Right? This is a light that radiates from the tradition. So, Ustad Nursi renovates and reinvigorates the sciences of Islam, the tradition, the tradition of the scholars, Sufis, Gnostics, right? the blessed people the inheritors of the Prophet He renovates and reinvigorates the sciences of Islam and the traditions that they have produced for us, the knowledge, the wisdom that they have left for us. Right? It renovates and reinvigorates it. And therefore, it renovates and reinvigorates the believer's ability to live in the light of those sciences, that wisdom. Right? But he does not innovate as to stray from the blessed traditions of the timeless community of believers, the Ummah. As such, Badu Zaman Said Nursi's teachings that are contained in the Risale Inur offer a fresh, sound, and safe, and that's important. Fresh, sound, and safe way to God that embraces and is able to benefit all travelers to God regardless of which specific path that they take in their individual journeys, as long as they remain loyal to the prophetic example. It is safe because it is on the path of the model of the Prophet wasallam, on the path of the Sunnah. It remains within the tradition, right? But it's also fresh and sound and addresses the, the needs of the age in a sound way. So it's relevant. It's contemporary, right? It is a contemporary articulation of timeless messages. So why read the Risale Inur? Because it will help you know your Lord. 
It will help you worship your Lord in a better way. It will help you attain, preserve, and increase in certainty in faith. Um, it will help you be a representative of the tradition. Be a representative of the inheritance that the Prophet ﷺ left to us. It will help you become, you know, from the edge maybe with baby steps, it will help you become an inheritor of the Prophet ﷺ. That is why, that is why uh, one should read the Risale Nur, and that is what one should intend in reading the Risale Nur, inshallah. Okay. This took longer than I thought it would. Uh, we will need one more episode for uh, a discussion of how we should read the Risale Inu. What are the things that we should pay attention to, be careful about in reading the Risale Inu, inshallah. That is the episode that's left. And after that, we will go back to our original course, uh, go back and continue from where we left in the book, the words. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma allamtana. إنك أنت العليم الحكيم وآخر الدعوة من الحمد لله رب العالمين الفاتحة اللهم صل على سيدنا